So we come to the come to the same subject we just talked about living life abundantly as we read that verse in John 10:10 10, 10, we're reminded that you know God's not satisfied with just giving us life he did that he created us but then he gave us a new life and that's found there in 2 Corinthians 5:17 17 down through the end of the chapter and he told tells us that we are now a new creation because of jesus christ because we have believed in him but now in this one he tells us it's not enough just to have life we're supposed to have life abundantly more abundantly i believe is what the king james says and the and 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 we are we're saying wow that's great now then you got to realize he wants you to have an eternal life so he's all about life, and that's what we're going to look at today. And I pray that you, as, we, as you follow along and as you read along with, your, with your, your sermon notes there, that God would reach into your heart, not because of my sermon, but if you'll pay attention to the words written in red in, that, in, in your sermon notes, you can pretty much ignore everything else that I say, but what's in red, you don't have a choice. You don't have an option to ignore that. Not as a Christian. As a Christian, we are to come together to, to put Him first and to choose life. So let's look at Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 20. I know it's a long reading, but I love it, and I couldn't cut any of it out. It says, now listen, today I am giving you a choice between life and death, between prosperity and disaster. For I command you this day to, have, to love the Lord your God and to keep His commandments, decrees, and regulations by walking in His ways. If you do this, you will live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you and the land you're about to enter and occupy. I want to I stop for just a second and say, yes, this is Old Testament. Yes, this is back Deuteronomy on... And, and, and many people are, are, are tempted to say, yeah, but that was God talking to the Jews. He's not talking to us there. I want to tell you, anything that God promises in God's word is available for you right now. It doesn't have a time limit on it. Because if you want to think about it for just a minute, God has no time. There is nothing about time for him. So if he said it back then, it applies to today just as much as it did to them. So apply it to your own life and keep it in your heart that, that, that this is what he says. He says, but if your heart turns away and you refuse to listen, and if you are drawn away to serve and worship other gods, then I warn you now that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live a long and good life in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to occupy. Today I have given you a choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make the choice by loving the Lord your God obeying Him and committing yourself firmly to Him. This is the key to your life. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We are given a promise here that we need to take hold of and apply to our lives that God wants you to live and He wants you to choose to live in a godly way. Heavenly Father, we... We bring the Word of God to, to each other with a thought in mind that we might be able to uh, encourage one another. We know, Lord, that your Word does not return void, that it never is empty or vain or, or completely dereft of meaning, but rather, Lord, that it comes to us in a fashion that is just as applicable today as it was then. And even though we were not born 
as in this church, even though we as Gentiles were not born in the, in the in the chosen people of God, the Jews, yet you have grafted us in through salvation. You have put us into that place where we are, your chosen. And we ask you, Lord, to be glorified today and give us the spiritual understanding as we hear with our ears. Let the Spirit deliver it to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. The Christian is a completely new creature. He's not a, he's not a creature that, that he once was. So whatever your life was like before salvation, Mark it down. It, it, it ain't there no more. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. What you were before salvation does not exist. Matter of fact, I would go so far to say whenever you ask the Lord Jesus to, to, to forgive you of your sins, he wipes them out. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, they are no longer there anymore. And no one, including Satan, can come against you and, and, and make demands that you answer for the life that you had before. It's gone. So keep in mind that whenever we talk about you being a new creature, literally at your salvation, at the moment that you said, I believe, that at that moment, God recreated you into a new creature completely. Now, we have a hard time with that because we have a memory. And we know what we were like. And we are tempted to go back and say, I'm sorry, Lord, I, I, I can remember this time in my life when... And the Lord looks at us and says, what are you talking about? This is gone. This is, this is not there anymore. And so I have things, I'll be honest with you, I had things in my life that I didn't... I didn't like. I, I did not, even as a Christian, I did things I did not like. Guess what? It's paid for. The reason why Satan is so good about coming to you and trying to do, uh, trying to carry you into that mindset of, well, look what you did, is because he doesn't want you to have an abundant life. He wants to stop you from having a good life here on this earth that can be transposed into a, an abundant life and then from an abundant life to an eternal life with him. So let's just look at it together over this, a new creation. So you choose in your salvation, you choose Jesus Christ, you choose to complete, realize your complete helplessness. In, in, in the Beatitudes, it put it this way. It says, it says blessed is the man who is, who is um, uh, the very first one. Come on, somebody help me with it. That, that, is, that is absolutely bereft. I'm going to put it in true language, in, in my language, that, that, that is completely bereft of any ability to pay your way. Okay. God knows that you are a sinner, but when you come to him, he wants you to come to him with that knowledge. But once you come to him with that knowledge and admit your sin, that as you do, you declare yourself to him and say, God, this is who I was. This is who I am in this sense. Then he forgives you. And when he forgives you, he wipes it out and puts the thought of it for him behind his own back and never looks back there. I, I know I tell you this all the time. It's okay. We have to keep telling ourselves what Satan wants to destroy you with things that are not there anymore. And so, and so when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, only he can bring forgiveness and the, and the chance to start this new life and to have this new life. His love for us is what drives us into the whole process from the very, before the very creation, he took you and he loved you. We don't understand that. We are, we're human. We don't, none, none of us understand that. 
that God could love me before I was even created, several thousand years before I ever took my first breath, God had already known me and loved me, knew my name, but that's what scripture teaches all the way through. And so when we realize that God, the love of God is what drives the whole process of salvation. So we choose to forget the past. Now, I realize when I read these verses that even Paul is saying, I have a hard time with this, but re realize the word choice. In Philippians 3.13, he says, No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. I like the way this version puts it. I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to the, to the end of the race and I receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ is calling us. God intends for you to win the race. God wants you to know that he is there cheering you on as you go through this race. He's already forgiven you of your sins, but there is still a race going on and we still have to make daily choices to live a holy life. God is the one though who takes you into that process and is in, his, in a sense cheering you on to take hold of the prize that is there in front of you. God's already given you the prize. All you got to do is take it now. So if old things are gone, then my thought is I'm just dumb enough to think we ought to treat them that way. They're not there no more. They're, not, they're gone. Now, that takes a choice on your part, the same choice we've been talking about. But when you do choose, you will realize that Satan will hit you even harder and harder and harder trying to get you to doubt that God really truly loved you enough that he forgave you of your error of the past. He just, that's, that's who, he, he wants to destroy you. The thief cometh not except to steal and to kill and destroy. He wants you to fail. But guess what? God wants you to have an abundant life. So all things are gone. We need to treat them that way. Ephesians chapter 4 21 through 23 says, Since you have heard about Jesus and, and learned the truth that comes from him, throw off the old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Notice that you throw off the old life. You have to get rid of it. You have to... And the wording is, is like throwing a baseball. It's like trying to throw it out of the ballpark. Get rid of your old life. But then he says, instead realize that the Holy Spirit is the one who will renew your thoughts. And he will renew your attitudes. So you've got to do two things. You've got to throw it away, the old life. And then you've got to let the Holy Spirit change you into the new one. You can't sit back and say all the time, well, I'm, I'm no good. I'm not, I, I, there's just nothing about me that's, you know, that I, God doesn't really love me. How could he love me because of what I've done? What you've done is gone if, in your belief in Jesus Christ. And how can you be anything but what God wanted you to be after he recreates you? So, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Remember that. We throw that stuff away, and then we come to this. So if you look at the Old Testament sacrifices, what did, good did they do, the, the people? Well, here, Hebrews 10.2 says this. It says that they could ne it could never remove their guilt. Okay, that implies that they could never have their guilt removed. It does not talk about you and the guilt you feel. He's talking about the fact that they couldn't, they could not, if they could have, if these sacrifices could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped. For the worshipers would have been purified once and for all, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. 
Now, let me take you on a little thought process here. If the old sacrifices could not remove your guilt because they were not perfect, and Jesus, who was perfect, died for you as a sacrifice, and you believed in that sacrifice, then it applies, does it not, that because of him, because of his sacrifice, now your guilt can be completely removed because the sacrifice that was offered is perfect. Did I just blow everybody away? Because I get some kind of vacant looks out here. Jesus was perfect. Those old sacrifices weren't. Those people's guilt was all the way up until the cross and at the resurrection when Jesus came out of the grave and you said, there, I believe. That was the sacrifice for my salvation. Now, God says your guilt can be wiped away because of it. Just put it this way. I, I was watching one time a, 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 a sporting event. I love to watch I, lo and I was watching hurdles and this girl was running all out down the hurdles and just boom, boom, boom. I love watching a good hurdler because they don't make sense to me. I don't know how they can do that. Okay. <laughs> have you ever had the same thought? Like, how can they run that fast and have hurdles in front of them? Well, she's going along fine, and my point is, I'm, I'm getting ready to say, never get tripped by a hurdle that's behind you, because that's what happened to her. She clipped the hurdle as she went over it, but she's still upright and running as fast as she can, and that hurdle flips forward and hits her on the heel, and she went end over end. And so my point is, that hurdle behind her tripped her up and it shouldn't have. In your life as a Christian, don't let the hurdle that you've already gone over and it's already, it's gone, don't let that one be the one that trips you up. Satan is lying to you and wants you to not have any hope of your salvation. So don't let him do that. And the way you do that is my next statement in there that, your new life is in front of you. Therefore, don't worry and watch for about what's... Don't, just watch where you're going. You're, don't look back. You're not going that way. You're not going back there. Okay? You're going this way. You're the hurdler going over the hurdles clean. God has removed them out of your process as you go over them. Don't start trying to look back to see what you've done. Don't look back to see what might have tripped you up in the process. Just understand, you're not going that way. You're going this way. You take those sprinters and those hurdlers, they've got one focus in mind, and it's not behind them. That focus is in front of them. So are you. Proverbs 5, 25 and 27 says, Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet and all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Move on. You did something. God forgave you. It's gone, now move on. And that's what Paul was saying when he said, I, I'm not here to say I've gotten this all correctly, but forgetting the things that are behind, I press forward because your focus needs to be ahead of you. So, so we have this new life. We have this life in Christ. Romans chapter six and verse four, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. See, God is again telling you, don't get tripped up with stuff that's behind you. Look forward into new life. Follow him. You know, and I put it this way. You know, the, we have to take the old world ways that we had and get rid of them because we don't want to be mashed it back into that mold. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. Don't get mashed back into the world's mold. 
but we are there to serve Him. So as we look at this, you set your sight on, uh, in this case, a head, which is above. We set our sights on things above and realize my old statement is still true. Keep looking up. Don't look down at, this, at the earth. Don't look down at the world. God has forgiven you of the things that you've gone through. They're out of your life. Regard them as dead and gone and just keep looking up. The way we can do that is to love not the world. Remember, I said don't get mashed back in there, but Numbers 11.1 1 says, And when, people com- when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. Why? Because they were worried about things that were of this world. They were not looking at what he was wanting them to do and press on. John, 1 John 12, uh, 1 John 2, verse 15 puts it this way. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For the love of the world, if any man love the, uh, lo- love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. God does not want you to set your, your sights and your affections on things here in this earth. He wants you to set your sights and affections on him and what he has for you. And look at that abundant life. You know, uh, I, used to, I used to say, uh, when Satan reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Well, I'm going to change it just a little bit. When Satan reminds you of your past, remind him of your future. What is, what is ahead of you? What are you looking forward to? Then, in, 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 and I put that in the fact of... of uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17, For this we declare to you by the word of, from the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, who are left until the coming of the Lord, shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout of a command, and with the voice of the archangel, and the, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And what's the next set of verses? What's the next verse, phrase? And so will we always be with the Lord. Our focus is not here. It's forward. We are always, we're going to, I was watching Jonathan Kahn for just a minute this morning, and he had a long rope. And what a great analogy. He had this white rope up on stage with him. And he throws it, and there's a great big long, and he says, imagine that goes out for eternity. And on the end of that rope, he had about three inches colored red. And he says, most people live their life in this three inches of red rope, focusing on, what can I do to make a living? What can I do to do better? What can I do to make our life more? What can I do? And they ignore the eternal life that is coming. Well, I don't want you to ignore the, the, the temporary life either, but I want you to realize your whole focus needs to be on the things that are coming, the eternal life, what's ahead of you. Remind him of his future comes next. I said, remind him of your future. Now remind him of his future. What does his future look like? And the devil that deceived them in Revelation 20.10, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That is Satan's future. What does your future look like? Eternal life eternal blessings of being with God, living life forever. What is his future? Not quite that nice. The temperature is going to be a lot more too. You see what I'm saying? We have to learn to live our abundant life. Now, that three inches, you get the choice to make choices to live it to the fullest for Christ so that the future is, is going to be even more glorious. But if you spend all of your life trying to worry about what is today, what this world brings, 
the pain today, the suffering today. Why is this happening to me? Why is it that I can't be like someone else who had, who's, who's, whose health stayed as good? Heaven knows my wife hears it plenty enough. Okay, I don't want to be trapped in this body. Guess what? I don't have a choice. And you don't either. But what I do have a choice of is I can make an abundant life now. I can set my thoughts on the things of God. I can come out of the, the doldrums and I can, I can serve Him and I can honor Him. And it's a life literally, an, we talked about it, an abundant life. It's not what the Satan wants to steal and kill and destroy. It's what you may have abundantly. Focus on the correct promise. Satan would not want you to, he wants to destroy you. He, you know, he wants to take your baggage and make it, and make it more than what you can pay for. It was, but you're fully forgiven. There's no baggage. That's what he's not going to ever tell you. Your guilt has been paid for whenever Jesus rose from the dead. You are free from that guilt of the things that were before. There is no guilt. There is no shame because Jesus took it on the cross. Why do you think that he hung on the cross naked in front of everyone and suffered the, the pain that he did? It wasn't for any other reason than your guilt and your shame were on the cross with him and he paid for it and he took it to the grave with him. Now we have no, no fear of the future. We have no fear of death because he did not stay in the grave. He rose. He rose from the dead in his, his resurrection. He took all of that and it was paid for and it was done and Satan was giggling because he thought he'd won the game. He'd won it. He'd killed the Lord Christ. And then Jesus came back from the dead and all his hopes and dreams were smashed because death was now defeated and Jesus had the keys to death in his hand. Somebody say amen or I'm going to. Where's Peggy when I need her? Man, you've got to, you've, there's no fear. So why do we live a mundane, boring, defeated life when we, could ha when we can have this abundant life that, that is, is wonderful now and then the everlasting life that is to come that's going to be beyond our imagination? It, the life that I'm talking about, an abundant life, is a life with, with, of liberty. I mean, we are free to live and serve Him and, and do what we can do in His name. He says, in, in Galatians, He said, So Christ has truly set us free, so live, stay free, and don't get tied up in the slavery of the law. And if I want to put it this way, all of that baggage that was behind you that you were guilty of, because it's gone. But we've been called into this freedom, in verse 13, we've been called into this freedom. So don't use that freedom to satisfy your sinful nature or to trip other people up, but to serve each other. So live in power, love, and peace, peace from on high. Um, Acts 1.8. You ever think about this word? But you shall receive power. You see the word I printed in black? Dunamis. I don't know if I said it right. Every time I try to say a Greek word, it comes out sounding like Spanish. Can't, can't help it. It's part of what we, we live here, okay? Dunamis is the word we get dynamite from. The power that we have is an explosive power We'll receive that when, when the Holy Spirit comes in. When you got saved, you got that power. And we're to be witnesses all over the world. So, love the Lord your God, Almighty God. 1 John 4.10, this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us 
and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sin. Huh. We just talked in great detail about that. Ephesians 3.19, may, may you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. See, even, even he was writing and saying, I, I don't get it completely, neither do you. Then you, which would made, then you will be made complete with all fullness of life and power that comes from God. So experiencing God and an and, and understanding in the least bit that we can how much he loves us brings you that abundant life. So our peace, which passes understanding, Philippians 4, 7, says, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, should keep your minds and hearts through Christ Jesus our Lord. This new life can only be lived in the Spirit. Okay, It cannot be lived in the flesh. Uh, Romans 7, 6 says, But now you have been released from the law, for we died to it, and there is no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. We have to live in the Spirit. Jeremiah, uh, or excuse me, Zechariah 4, 6 says, then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The Christian life's way too hard for you. You cannot live it. So drop the pretenses of your ability to be a good person and realize there's no way we can accept that Jesus Christ gave that opportunity to you as a gift. When he created you new, he gave you that you are seen as Christ, not as your old name. So, what is it? Well, we have to become totally reliant on him. That's all it is. It's just Him alone. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Only. He's the only one that has the power. And it's only through Him. I've heard people lately, it's become kind of popular to really diss people who believe this verse. It says, it says, you know, I can do all things through Christ. Have, you, have you, any of you seen it on Facebook especially? The one that offends me the most is probably the ver the the, the meme that says I can do all things through a, a verse taken out of context. It's, that statement makes me boil inside. The verse can be lived. We can accept it as ours. Because what we're saying in that is I can't do it, but I serve the one who can. I can't live that life, but Jesus did and can in me. And from now on, only through him, not through anything else, but in God's power and never in my own power, I can do all things that God wants me to accomplish through him because of his strength. And so can you. Do you have to always feel it? No, you don't have to feel it. You can just claim it and move on because he wants you to take it by faith. So what are you battling in your life? Are you battling things on this earth? Well, guess what? The things that you're being accused of are not there anymore. Because my, my Bible says that his sacrifice was good once and forever, and he sat down at the right hand of God, finished. Did you know that whenever a priest was serving in the, in the, in the, in the bringing the sacrifices, that he never sat down, I'd be in real trouble because I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't stand that long. But he never sat down. They were busy all during the time they were on and for the whole time that they were on, for the months that they were on. But did you realize that he never sat down after, after offering the sacrifices? My Bible says Jesus, once he offered that one sacrifice forever, his own body, he sat down at the right hand of God 
indicating it's done. There's no more sacrifices to bring. It was his and his alone. And that's the one that you accept when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen? Amen. Uh, let's just get up and, and, and sing and be glorified in what God's Word has said to us. Because it's, my Bible says all of God's Word is, has a promise with it. It'll never return void. It's not going to ever be empty. We just have to say, there it is. It said it. I believe it. Because he lives, let's all sing. Okay. Because he lives. That's not it. Hang on. Let's get it on the right verse. I, I, I was looking for... Go- That's the one I that's the one I was looking for. All of our all of our brains were saying all, all of them were going negative. This isn't the one, okay? And I'm looking at these two music directors up here that I'm looking at going, "Huh? No. I don't think we can start in the middle." Now we're on God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lived. Now we can sing that part. Because He lived. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future. When life is worth the living just because he lives. Get that. I want you to get one thought out of that. And that is, it's because of his life that we have life at all. And once we accept him, we all of it, he holds the future. And life is only worth living because he lives. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we are grateful for your presence in our church today. We thank you for the fact that you have promised that where two or three are gathered in your name, that you're right here in the middle of us. And Lord, I just pray that you would take us to our homes in health, that you would uh, make it, a, make it a, a joyful life, a joyful rest of the day, rest of the week. And Lord, that we would learn to live an abundant life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.